Come with me back in time to 2005. Tony Blair is prime minister. YouTube has only just been founded. And on September the 19th, the third season of Arrested Development premieres with an episode entitled The Cabin Show. The episode features a flashback scene between Lucille and her son Buster. And the good for her era officially begins. Claiming she could take it no more, the young mother released the emergency brake, allowing her car to roll backwards into the nearby lake. Good for her. A little less than 10 years after the episode aired, during the peak Tumblr years, a screenshot of Lucille saying good for her became a meme and an extraordinarily popular gif. These were usually used as a reaction to a story, whether from real life or from fiction, of women doing morally gray or taboo acts. By reacting with the gif, the creator was expressing approval and identification with the story's subject, despite its dark or edgy nature. The good for her meme officially turned cinematic on August the 7th of 2020, when one Twitter user tweeted out a photo collage of several movies with the caption, good for her cinematic universe. From left to right, the movies shown are The Witch, Midsommar, Us, The Invisible Man, Knives Out, Gone Girl, Ready or Not, and the Suspiria remake. This tweet blew up, in part due to debate around the validity of this cinematic universe. The user then added to the chaos by tweeting, damn, you guys are taking this tweet too seriously, with another photo collage further expanding the definition by including films like Ex Machina and Hard Candy. The original tweet has over 146,000 likes, and the Good For Her cinematic universe is still being debated today. Like, I tweeted a tweet about what this video was going to be about. I didn't even say it was about the Good For Her universe. I just put screen grabs of, like, four movies we'll be talking about and asked people to guess what the topic would be. And, like, I'm still getting notifications from an argument that's going on between people discussing whether or not certain films belong in that universe. Like, people are very invested in this. This proto-genre appears to encompass a wide variety of tones, at least according to all the letterbox lists when you Google good for her cinema. Rom-coms can apparently be good for her films, but so can horror, period dramas, murder mysteries, even children's films. Some lists classify like Legally Blonde, Carrie, Matilda, Gone Girl, Kiki's Delivery Service, and Obvious Child as good for her movies all alongside each other. In this um, discourse, a lot of film buffs are criticizing this broadness specifically, for a genre to be a genre, they say, there needs to be criteria. There needs to be a specific similarity or similarities across these movies to justify them being grouped together. Well, I'm here to tell you today that there are criteria for the good for her genre because I have simply made them up. I have spent the last month watching so-called good for her movies and attempting to figure out like what makes a good for her movie and why we find them so well good. So strap in as I attempt to define a genre that started as a joke tweet based on a meme from about 20 years ago. Let's see where this goes, shall we? Part one, the good for her format. I am proposing there are five criteria for a good for her movie, five benchmarks that a movie must meet in order to truly be of the genre. To illustrate these five criteria, I am going to be comparing three movies from seemingly three different genres, The Invisible Man, Knives Out, and Matilda. There are gonna be massive spoilers for all three of these movies, so I guess if that bothers you, pause this video, go and watch them, and then come back to this section. The first criteria is easiest. In order for a movie to be good for her, it must have a hair heroine as the central role. A good for her movie needs a her, and that her needs to be the main character. If she's a foil, a sidekick, or a secondary character, it doesn't count. The Invisible Man has Cecilia, Knives Out has Marta, and Matilda has, of course, Matilda. The heroine is stuck within or falls victim to an unjust social system. Oftentimes this experience is traumatic and most often is patriarchal in nature. In The Invisible Man, Cecilia is in an abusive relationship with her former boyfriend. After her initial escape, said boyfriend fakes his own death and torments her and her loved ones by wearing a piece of technology that makes him invisible. Cecilia figures this out very quickly, but no one believes her, not even her best friend who is a detective. So really Cecilia is trapped in two systems, an abusive romantic relationship and a legal system that doesn't believe women. In Knives Out, Marta is at the mercy of several of these structures of inequality through her class, ethnicity and gender. Most obviously she works as a nurse for Harlan, the patriarch of the wealthy Thromby family. The family repeatedly assert their dominance over Marta by using her as a prop in their political arguments, subjecting her to a series of 
micro turned macro aggressions and most importantly, controlling her. Marta's mother is undocumented and her family is at the mercy of the US immigration system. That system disempowers Marta and her family and makes it easier for the thrombies to control her. Ransom, AKA Chris Evans, tries to use Marta to kill Harlan so that he can have his inheritance. He switches the medications in Marta's med kit, hoping that she'll give Harlan a lethal dosage unwittingly. Martha actually gives Harlan the right dosage, but due to the label swap, thinks that she has given him the lethal one instead. Marta immediately wants to call an ambulance and get help, but Harlan, in an attempt to protect her, decides to commit suicide and gives Marta a series of instructions to fool any detectives. When she resists, he reminds her that if she becomes a suspect in his murder, the legal system will most likely discover her mother's undocumented status. And yet Marta still wants to get help. Harlan ends up taking the decision out of her hands by cutting his own throat and in shock, Marta follows his instructions. After Harlan's death, the surviving Thromby family maintains their usual treatment of Marta until it's revealed that Harlan has left his entire fortune to her. Once their financial superiority over her is threatened, everything escalates. It's knives out, baby. They threaten her, insult her, manipulate her, including most notably Ransom, Harlan's grandson, who starts controlling her in order to help her. But he's really just doing it to save his own skin. And then finally in Matilda, both Matilda and Miss Honey are trapped in traditional family power structures. There's Matilda with her just awful biological parents and Miss Honey with her maternal aunt, Miss Trunchable. In these relationships, there is an assumption that one, authority derives from seniority and two, no matter how awful, you have to stick with your biological family. The heroine fights said system by playing by her own rules. Frequently, she transcends this system by adopting a gray morality. This criteria often but not always manifests as a revenge plot or an outsmarting montage. This is also where the satisfaction starts to kick in. There's nothing like a heroine who brings a gun to a knife fight. In The Invisible Man, Cecilia outsmarts both the legal system and her abuser. At the end of the movie, she teams up with James her detective friend and goes into her ex-boyfriend Adrian's house wearing a wire. She pretends to want to get back together with him and tries to get Adrian to confess to the murder of her sister, a crime he initially framed her for. When he sticks to his cover story, Cecilia goes over James's head. She excuses herself to go to the bathroom, puts on the invisible suit that she stole and makes it look like Adrian kills himself. The entire thing is caught on CCTV cameras, but obviously Cecilia is nowhere to be seen, so it looks like a suicide. Cecilia uses the same weapons that were used to abuse her, surveillance technology, the invisible suit, and the law, and repurposes them into tools with which she can liberate herself. In Knives Out, Marta refuses to play by the Thromby's rules and stays true to herself and her own morals. First, she refuses to renounce the inheritance because she wants to honor Harlan's wishes, despite immense pressure from the family. Ransom convinces Marta that housekeeper Fran believes that she killed Harlan. When Ransom forces Fran to take an overdose of morphine and tricks Marta into discovering the body, he doesn't anticipate Marta resuscitating Fran and getting her to the hospital. Marta doing the right thing thwarts his entire plan. She then confesses, going against Harlan's instructions, and her confession ultimately helps liberate her. Finally, in order to trick Ransom into confessing, she lies to his face, something that she has struggled to do throughout the movie as lying makes her physically sick. Right before the end of the movie, the case detective explicitly tells her, I want you to remember something very important. You won not by playing the game Harlan's way, but yours. In Matilda, Matilda subverts the biological family power dynamic when she realizes that children have the power to punish adults too. So she dyes her father's hair, puts glue on his hat, torments Trunchable with the ghost of Miss Honey's father. She also gets Miss Honey to adopt her, leaving behind her biological family in exchange for a much healthier, much less traditional found family instead. As the lyrics to the Matilda musical song Naughty go, just because you find that life's not fair, it doesn't mean that you just have to grin and bear it. If you always take it on the chin and wear it, nothing will change. Even if you're little, you can do a lot. You mustn't let a little thing like little stop you. Finishing with the lines, nobody else is going to put it right for me. Nobody but me is going to change my story. Sometimes you have to be a little bit naughty. The heroine should not feel guilt over transcending the unjust system and should instead end in a state of personal autonomy Economy and newfound power. The her in question needs to feel good. These movies are not about moral 
regret or lingering doubt. In The Invisible Man, you just have to look at Cecilia's post-murder smirk. She's free from her abuser and an abusive legal system. She's won. In Knives Out, Marta starts the film feeling guilty as hell, but by the end of Ransom's confession, she lets go of that guilt. She realizes that she's not responsible for Harlan's death, that she doesn't owe the Thrombies anything, and that she's basically one of the only good people in this movie. The iconic final shot of Knives Out shows Marta sipping from the My House, My Rules mug on a balcony that she now owns looking down on the Thrombies. She's free of any remorse, and rightly so. And Matilda, have you seen a less guilty character? She's off reading Moby Dick with her amazing adopted lesbian mum, using her telekinetic powers to make books float. Like, she doesn't have time to feel guilty about abusive adults. And finally, there should be a sense of victory and catharsis for both her and the audience. This is the most subjective criteria, but also perhaps the most important. How do you feel at the end of the movie? Are we the audience saying, good for her? A true good for her movie will have people cheering in the theater, but a lot of that depends on who is in the theater in the first place. I think it's safe to say that most people feel a sense of victory at the end of The Invisible Man, Knives Out and Matilda, but not all movies are so clear cut. My co-writer for this video, Isabel and I, kept debating whether or not movies like Carrie and Promising Young Woman counted as good for her films. Both feature characters stuck in patriarchal systems who transcend said systems by playing by their own rules. Carrie is shamed by her mother and classmates for essentially just going through puberty. After relentless mockery and abuse, she, like Matilda, develops telekinetic powers and uses it to seek revenge on those who harmed her. Likewise, Cassie, in Promising Young Woman, who is still reeling from the trauma of her friend Nina's rape and consequent suicide, seeks justice on everyone who harmed Nina, from the dean who didn't believe her, the lawyer who defended her attackers, to the characters who witnessed the rape and didn't intervene or report it. So far, both Carrie and Promising Young Woman are good for her movies, based on the criteria, but at the end of both of these films, the protagonists die. Cassie manages to have a kind of post-mortem revenge by setting it up so that after her death, Al Monroe, Nina's rapist and Cassie's murderer is arrested at his own wedding. And it's implied that Carrie's spirit will still be around, whether physically bursting out of her grave or having that serve as metaphoric haunting of those who harmed her during her life. These movies' categorization all depend on your interpretation of them. When you see Carrie White die after burning everything down, do you feel like she's escaping her poetry patriarchal system or that she's imploding underneath it. When the cops show up at El Monroe's wedding, did you cheer or did you wonder whether the legal system would continue to fail Cassie and Nina? For me, these movies are subversions of the genre. They interact with the five criteria but twist the audience's expectations in a compelling way. They're sort of honorary good for her movies. Unlike, I don't know, Gone Girl. Gone Girl um, is absolutely not a good for her movie. The edges of the genre. That's right, I said it, Gone Girl is not a good for her movie, but it does have good for her elements. You see, a movie can have a good for her character, a good for her scene, a good for her moment, without it necessarily being a good for her movie. The scene in EZA, for example, when she walks down her school hallway in lingerie with an A emblazoned on her chest, that is a good for her scene. Glenn Close as Cruella DeVille talking about marriage and 101 Dalmatians is a good for her moment. And the cool girl montage and monologue from Gone Girl, that absolutely is good for her vibes, but Amy Dunn never transcends a patriarchal system. She simply exploits it for her own gain. And therein lies the difference. The Cool Girl monologue is this very cathartic moment where Amy articulates how the male gaze traps women inside this impossible performance, while appearing to escape that performance by carrying out the perfect crime. But at the end of the movie, she returns to her marriage and that public performance of perfection. Amy never transcends her circumstances. She just embraces those circumstances circumstances from a position of power born of weaponizing her white wealthy womanhood. She basically Serena Joys herself. Amy Dunn is a brilliant villain who's very fun to watch but I'm not happy for her at the end of the movie. I was never rooting for her to get back together with Ben Affleck. Like both of their lives are going to suck now and they're gonna make everyone around them miserable as well. As critic Gabrielle Cole puts it, the ending is not a celebratory occasion but rather a gutting and shocking portrayal of what happens when two terrible Terrible people push each other too far. Midsommar is another film that regularly gets categorized as a good for her movie, but I think it's far more of a yikes for her movie, I guess. The central character Danny is certainly stuck in these like systems of oppression. She's in a toxic relationship with a manipulative guy who is 
only still with her out of awkward guilt and obligation. And by the end of the movie, she is, you know, not in that relationship anymore because she is in a murderous cult instead. Danny goes from one system to another and objectively being indoctrinated into a potentially white supremacist cult is, um, you know, way worse than having a shitty boyfriend. Danny never has a playing by her own rules moment. She's a very reactionary protagonist. She doesn't really drive the plot of Midsommar. Midsommar just sort of happens to her. We watch her get manipulated by her boyfriend and by the cult who make her feel like she has choices when she really doesn't. Whether or not Danny decided to join the cult, there would have been a May Queen crowned and Christian would have died. Danny is neither a hero nor a villain. She's kind of just a victim and never really becomes more than that. An article in Lithium Magazine writes that Danny has clearly been broken down by a white supremacist cult throughout the course of the film. They've groomed her with praise, given her a false sense of family, and ultimately forced her to join their cult by murdering all her friends. This is not a powerful moment of feminist fury, it's a heart-wrenching example of how cults prey on the fragile and the weak. Like when I see Midsommar, I don't think good for her. I think, babes, get out of there. Oh no. I wanna take a moment here to thank today's sponsor, Aura. If you're a horror baby who has trouble falling asleep after watching a spooky movie or on the other end of the spectrum are too pumped up from a good Halloween classic to chill out and you just lie awake for hours, this all-in-one sleep and wellbeing app might be for you. The app is full of thousands of stories, meditations, exercises, and life coaching audios created by experts around the world. I am personally a big fan of being able to to merge audiobooks with classic relaxing noises so it sounds like I'm being read Anne of Green Gables during a storm in the woods. I've been listening to that at night and it has been brilliant to help with that winding down process as I go to sleep. The recommendation system is also personalized to make it as effective as possible in suggesting tracks and experts that work for you from general methods to help with stress to sessions on specific phobias, worries or experiences. Also I had a lot of fun creating my own soundscapes in the app to listen to while I work because rather than being a one-size-fits-all model you can choose what sounds to include and control the noise levels of each element, which is exactly what I needed to find the noises that made my ADHD brain go, yes, you will concentrate now. And that has definitely helped me while working on the script for this video. You can get started completely free on Aura's website using my special link in the description. The first 500 people get a free trial and an exclusive 25% off. So if this sounds like it might be useful for you, why not give it a go? Part two, the appeal. Although, as we've discovered, the good for her format can be applied to almost any genre, the realm of horror is where it shines brightest. And there is a reason for that. Women have had a place in the world of horror for as long as it has existed. Rebecca and The Birds, two famous Hitchcock horror movies, were originally written by Daphne du Maurier. Alice Guy Brichet, one of the first female directors, created some of the earliest examples of horror on film. Yet almost no one has heard her name, even though her work was another inspiration behind Hitchcock's movies, and she is credited as the pioneer of narrative filmmaking itself. One of the earliest female screenwriters, Ruth Ann Baldwin, wrote the first werewolf film, The Werewolf, in the early 1910s. In a potentially surprising storyline for how we conceptualize American attitudes at the time, the story revolves around a Navajo woman who transforms into a wolf and kills the white colonizers invading her land. Unfortunately, you won't be able to watch the movie. Trust me, I immediately wanted to drop everything and do just that when I first read about it, because it was one of the lost films destroyed in a fire in the 19th 1920s at Universal Studios. And it wasn't just behind the camera that women appear in horror history. The sight of a screaming damsel in distress is easy to conjure from memories of horror flicks. It doesn't feel like a stretch to say that horror alongside rom-coms might be one of the, if not the, genre with the most women in leading roles. But why is this? Is this some kind of feminist takeover of these stories, a grand conspiracy? Well, no, there's a bunch of reasons and some of them are probably the opposite. After all, if you're trying to make an audience really fear for a potential horror victim, what better way than to make them the ultimate vulnerable and weak figure, a woman. Being the lead in a horror movie doesn't necessarily make you a complex character or a compelling lead. It might just be that you are the one screaming for the longest as you survive a relentless ordeal. The Final Girl. The Final Girl is one of the most iconic tropes in the horror genre and is an obvious predecessor and contemporary of the good for her protagonist. The Final Girl, because she is almost always a woman and often a teenage girl, is essentially what she says on the tin. The last one standing, the survivor in slasher flicks. You see her throughout horror history. Laurie in Halloween, Sydney Prescott in Scream, Marie Collingwood from The Last House on the Left, Jess Bradford from Black Christmas, Ginny from the Friday the 13th series, and Nancy from A Nightmare on Elm Street. 
In the early days of the trope, she tended to be a virgin, often in comparison to other girls who died during the film's runtime. The term was coined by film theorist Carol J. Clover in her book Men, Women and Chainsaws, where she writes, She is the one who encounters the mutilated bodies of her friends and perceives the full extent of the preceding horror and her own peril, who is cornered, wounded, whom we see scream, stagger, fall, rise and scream again. She is abject terror personified. There is this sense in the traditional idea of the final girl of women being rewarded for living a certain way. You know, she's not like other girls. She's not some dumb slut. She's a sweet girl, untainted by the outside world until it comes for her in the movie. She hasn't already been corrupted. A study was conducted on 57 different slashes, which found that non-surviving female characters were more frequently sexual than the surviving characters of any gender. The underlying message, whether deliberate or born from unconscious bias, is that female sexuality Sexuality is dangerous, or maybe that it deserves punishment. As critic Grace Pullman writes, the final girl is the gold standard, the role model for the impressionable female viewer. She alleged that the women's liberation movement had a part to play in this dynamic. Feeling threatened, horror giants in Hollywood began killing and torturing fictional facsimiles of the liberated woman, depicting her as amoral, inferior, and vapid. They punished her with a painful, sensational death, playing out these scenarios over and over again on the silver screen. Then they created the idealized prototype of the final girl and rewarded her obedience, her purity, by sparing her life. As if to say to the women in the audience, this is your only hope for survival. As if to say, this is how you must behave or you'll die we'll kill you. It is worth noting, however, that one of the earliest examples before this idea of the ultimate innocent was codified and replicated was Jess in Black Christmas in the 1980s. We know that she has definitely had sex because she is literally pregnant during the movie, with the virginal character of Claire actually being the first to die. The 2006 remake plays with this idea, casting actresses like Mary Elizabeth Winstead, who have the final girl vibes in other roles to throw you off the trail of who would survive to the end, if anyone. Final girl subversion. The trope is subverted in many modern horror movies, probably the most famous example of this being Cabin in the Woods, where the trope itself is discussed and dissected on screen. Remakes of old classics give us alternatives too. Jamie Lee Curtis grows from classic babysitter final girl in the original Halloween to a shotgun wielding grandma in Halloween Kills. Midsommar, in its manic and ultimately depressing ending, shows us the image of a final girl, but the story of something twisted and darker. Danny does survive the spate of gruesome deaths to emerge as the one survivor, but at what cost? We see this similar dynamic play out way back in 1988 with American Gothic, a movie where the final girl joins the murderous family itself before breaking down and killing them too. Rape Revenge. On the opposite side of the coin to the sheltered final girl is the protagonist of the rape revenge narrative. Again, this genre is pretty much what it sounds like, with the film format playing out in two parts. In the first, a woman is raped, and in the second, she gets her revenge. Examples include I Spit on Your Grave, Lipstick, The Ladies Club, and The Violator. The genre itself has a reputation for being... Um, kind of gross and sleazy with explicit and brutal scenes throughout going for a real sense of shock value but this isn't the only way to conceptualize it as clover points out the 1970s when the genre was first emerging was also when rape was increasingly being regarded as a serious social issue far from cheapening the issue could these movies be a way of exposing the horror it creates some people argue that ignoring these stories or sanitizing them with illusions and subtext just allow people to ignore them these movies are at the very least confronting you with the horror of rape. There are many women that find the genre inherently exploitative, but there are others that embrace it. As Alexandra Helen Nicholas, the author of Rape Revenge Films, A Critical Study, told one journalist, There is a broad range of women I've met who embrace these films for their sometimes unflinching determination to not hide the horror of sexual violence, and it's not difficult to find these writings, like my own, both online and in print. We also see a range of movies where the rape of a woman is avenged by a man, most often her father or boyfriend. The most mainstream of these is probably the movie Taken, where a girl is kidnapped by a sex trafficking ring. And then the movie is focused on the journey of her father and what he goes through to rescue her, ending with her safe and apparently emotionally unaltered by her experiences. This use of women's trauma to further men's revenge has been criticized by some, including Sarah Pajansky in her book, Watching Rape, Film and Television in Postmodern 
modern culture, saying they depend on rape to motivate and justify a particularly violent version of masculinity, relegating the women to minor props in the narrative. The origins of this genre frequently forwent the emotional journey of the lead, focusing instead on the external violence of her actions. However, we've seen entries into this genre that do delve into the inner life and journey of these women. MFA, for example, just released a few years ago, has protagonist Noelle go on a journey of violent and performative revenge, but also gives her the space to acknowledge that the immediate catharsis of that moment is ultimately not a way to heal her trauma. It's not hard to see the path being paved for the good for her genre over these years of horror and thriller movies, from The Final Girl to Rape Revenge, but what has made good for her movies so satisfying in particular? Why is the good for her narrative so appealing? Movies that fit into this genre have inspired enduring fan bases and in-depth analysis for, I think, a range of interconnected reasons. There is how they make a viewer feel in the moment, their instinctual reaction in the cinema, but also how it makes them feel afterwards, the thoughts, fears, and worries they live with that are explored in such a particular way on screen, particularly for women watching. So let's dig into the elements of good for her movies that make them so damn satisfying. Regaining agency. In 1938, a play called Gaslight made its debut on the London stage. It was so popular that in the following six years, not one, but two film adaptations were released. It tells the story of Bella and Jack, a married couple in Victorian London. It becomes clear throughout the play that he is trying to convince her that she is going mad. He gives her things to look after, but then hides them so that she thinks they've disappeared under her watch. He convinces her that she's imagining the gas lights in the house are dimming, when in fact, he is responsible for their light lowering. It's from this play that we get the now commonly used phrase gaslighting, a form of manipulation where an abuser attempts to convince their victim that what they are feeling or experiencing is not based in reality, that they are going mad. In the play, Bella discovers that Jack has been searching the apartment above theirs, the apartment of an old woman who he has killed, looking for her fortune of jewels. When he turned on the lights in her apartment to search, the gas lights dimmed in their own house below. Bella works with a detective to expose her husband as the murderer, twisting the metaphorical knife in by only pretending to help him escape, reminding him that she can't be held responsible for her actions against him as, by his own reasoning, she's insane. The play itself, which I think goes a bit harder than the film adaptations, has big good for her energy, especially during the finale where he is tied up and he tells her to use his razor to cut him free. The script says that she holds up the razor with deadly rage that is close to insanity and then pretends that she can't even see it in her hand, echoing his own gaslighting of her by insisting, I'm always losing things. I can never find them. I can't remember where I put them. She then accuses him of being mad and then puts the razor to his throat as he is tied up, helpless, before calling in the detective. Like the line, I shall watch you die with glory in my heart, goes as hard today as it did in the 1930s. There is a deep satisfaction, I think, in the gulf between where she is at her lowest in the play and this ending in which she is able to make her own decisions and emerge triumphant with her own agency. This scene is delightfully similar to the good for her moment at the end of The Invisible Man, where Cecilia makes her husband slit his own throat. In an act that exonerates her of any wrongdoing in his death and mirrors the death of her sister, to exact an equal revenge on him. We go from apparent helplessness, dark night of the soul type circumstances, to active agency and triumph. Good for her movies are not about passive protagonists. They're not simply women who are reacting to what is happening. They take charge, make plans, discover evidence. They go through a negative, often actively traumatic experience and react to that by actively trying to change their circumstances. The good for her heroine doesn't just give in to the power of the person or system causing that trauma. Sometimes this is to get revenge, but that isn't necessarily always the case. This dream of achieving agency from a system that would harm you is one familiar to most women, but but we do, as the saying goes, live in a society, uh, and so it's not exactly an easy escape in reality. We might be able to say, screw you to a sexist boss, but outside that office, the issue of sexism doesn't go away. And in fact, the act of voicing your discontent with said sexism can ultimately backfire and reflect worse on you than the person in the wrong. You're making a fuss, ruining a man's reputation, not being a team player. 
There's something very satisfying about seeing characters in a movie get to move through the world with purpose and with agency that is ultimately rewarded and not punished. A brilliant example of a movie that does this while skirting around the edges of the good for her genre is Mad Max Fury Road, where a group of women rather than a singular victim get revenge on the man who has terrorized them. The very start of their story in the film is about agency and liberation, as the movie deliberately doesn't show us their sexual abuse on screen, instead evidencing it through subtext like the chains that they wear and the fact that one of them is pregnant. They're already on the run when we meet them and the triumphant ending moment is not just about their own freedom but returning to grant freedom to the people of the oppressive regime that they come from. The issue of agency is one of the key reasons why Midsommar is not truly a good for her movie. The aesthetic of good for her agency and triumph is utilized, even though Danny never fully achieves it. And I think that's why a lot of people assume that it's a good for her movie, because what they remember is the enduring final image. The cheating boyfriend getting his just desserts is a lot less satisfying when his death is so horrific and the cheating in question was drug induced and non-consensual. The manic grinning of the iconic flower crown shot that in another story might well have represented true triumph is good for her in image only here. Behind the aesthetic, is a young woman whose mind has been broken and manipulated. She's imprisoned in one oppressive state to another from beginning to end in many ways, whether in the American world of individualism where she feels alienated even in a crowded city from her sister and then from her boyfriend, or in the close-knit cult which erases identity and normalizes harrowing acts in its wake. Fantasize justice. When it comes to women's pain, particularly in regards to abuse, we know that achieving true justice is often asking the impossible. In the UK, only one in a hundred rapes recorded by police in 2021 resulted in a charge that same year, let alone a conviction. Sarah Everard was killed by a police officer last year who used his authority to kidnap her, claiming he was arresting her so that she would get into his car. Since then, various group chats and messages from police officers have been exposed, which show rampant sexism and racism and more in the most vile ways possible. And I can't say any woman in my life was particularly surprised by this. It felt like confirmation of something that had long been expected by those of us who have either gone through or helped a friend with reporting an assault or attempting to engage with the criminal justice system at all. Although many people consider justice to be within the confines of the legal system, or even in a world free of that system altogether through things like restorative justice, other people are still drawn to the idea of retribution. Hard Candy is at the extreme end of Good For Her movies, starring a young Elliot Page as a 14 year old girl who goes after a groomer and murderer. Almost the entire movie is focused around her physically and psychologically torturing him before finally persuading him to end his own life. I think many viewers, even those who wouldn't consider this model of justice to be like workable or even wanted in reality, still find this angle on the genre satisfying to watch in its simplicity, knowing that the alternative would be him getting away with doing this again. I think one of the reasons that Promising Young Woman polarized so many viewers was because it ends with law enforcement ostensibly coming to the rescue, although too late to save our protagonist, Cassie. Many were expecting her to get her good for her moment, to have that agency and pain rewarded with a triumphant rally and cool and for them as viewers to get to feel this kind of catharsis but instead we got this false and empty victory in the world of the movie and in ours we know that the odds of justice truly being served after the credits roll are unlikely at best for me this was entirely fitting for the movie itself and its dark cynical tone but it shunts it out of the full good for her genre structure which i know that a lot of viewers were expecting catharsis catharsis is the release of emotion or tension held inside of us good for her movie movies allow this release in two ways. First, via short-lived tension born from empathy for the on-screen protagonist in the moment, but also the long-lived underlying tension from our own experiences which never saw justice met. One of the things that's very apparent in these movies, pretty universally, is that they are depressingly unrealistic. This is where the catharsis often comes from, right? Giving life to things that you can't actually experience. That is a catharsis for the character, but also for the audience itself. Sometimes, like in the case of The Invisible Man, this is violent in nature, a deserved comeuppance. But we also have examples of cathartic justice in a more literal sense in movies like Legally Blonde and Gerald's Game, both of which involve courtroom scenes where our protagonists prove their strength in untraditional ways. For Elle in Legally Blonde, that is using her feminine knowledge to win a case and prove herself as a lawyer. Whereas for Jesse in Gerald's Game, it is confronting the man who left her for dead in court, where she tells him, you're so much smaller than I remember, before walking away. 
In this way, it's easy to see Promising Young Woman as a good for her movie setup that then deliberately subverts the genre to cut across that hopeful manic energy of possibility with a sudden stark reality. Reality is almost always incompatible with good for her narratives. Once you know about Cassie's plan and view it in the context of a world that plays by our reality's rules, instead of it seeming like a triumphant finale, it's in fact revealed as an act of desperate self-destruction that she doesn't expect to survive. Validating women's fears. Women's fears in good for her movies are not just acknowledged but legitimized it isn't silly paranoia it's real and you aren't crazy for feeling like this sexism is an everyday horror whose presence we've naturalized but whose effects still haunt us this is done not just through the storylines but all the way down to the level of cinematography in these movies. The Invisible Man utilizes our expectations of framing to do just this. Throughout the film, there are lingering shots with no one in frame, a lot of negative space when Cecilia is in shot, even shots peeking out from behind a wall or door as if through the eyes of someone watching. The camera pans from Cecilia to reveal nothing, but the audience is still primed to search for any hint of danger because our movie going experiences tell us something significant must be there for the camera to have panned to show it. We expect those empty spaces to be filled and it implies a presence of someone on scene. In this way, the experience of watching these shots is a perfect microcosm of the experience of being a woman. You know that this man walking towards you might not actually mean you harm, but can you take that chance? You can never escape the potential dangers that you're warned about from girlhood. Worries that take up literal and figurative space in your mind and your life. Real experiences of abuse. In The Invisible Man, we don't see Cecilia's abusive relationship with Adrian, her ex-boyfriend. We just have to believe her. It's easy to do when the way he's acting is common behavior among abusers, sans the invisibility, of course. However, we also see the experience of friends, family, and law enforcement not believing survivors, including her friend James, who seems the most poised to be supportive. The invisibility in the movie leads to some brilliant fight sequences and jump scares, but it's at its most powerful when it actualizes a state of mind for those escaping abuse, the fear that they will be found. The line, he'll haunt you if you let him, don't let him, him from Cecilia's friend James is well-meaning but ultimately unhelpful. After all, victims are most at risk after they leave an abusive partner. The film's hook is far future technology, but it depicts very real experiences, like an abuser messing with bodily autonomy, replacing birth control to deliberately impregnate her. This reproductive abuse is a horrific act by a fictional madman, but is also something that affects people in real life. Although the film depicts an exaggerated futuristic technology in the Invisible Man suit, the reality is that existing and newly developed technologies are already putting vulnerable people at risk. There are now a number of cyber safety guides available for survivors of domestic abuse online, including advice on finding the best router for your protection, how to utilize VPNs, and specific social media privacy settings you should use. The New York Times published a piece a few years ago that explored the gaslighting facility facilitated by smart home technology, horrifyingly similar to the plot of the play Gaslight, where abusers would mess with the appliances for no other reason than to make their victims think that they're losing their minds. Being able to alter someone's lived environment is one of the ultimate forms of control, added to the possibility of these devices being used as personal surveillance. The article listed experiences from multiple women. One woman had turned on her air conditioner, but said it then switched off without her touching it. Another said the code numbers of the digital lock at her front door changed every day and she could not figure out why. Still another told an abuse helpline that she kept hearing the doorbell ring, but no one was there. These all sound like they could be ripped straight from tense scenes in horror movies. Technologies like facial recognition and deep fakes, which are ever improving, are yet more examples of tools that are primed for abuse. Isolation and alienation. Many of these movies also pull in other genres to give validation to these fears. The detective genre in Knives Out, for example, gives us a cat and mouse framework that serves to isolate Marta further, knowing that in the elaborate game of rich families and eccentric detectives, as in the social game of class, she is entirely alone. The Invisible Man, on the other hand, is an example of the Gothic genre, which originated in England in the second half of the 18th century, and is often thought of as a dark, melodramatic, supernatural story filled with stormy castles and monstrous villains. Although it's had many of these elements through the years, this ultimately is a patchwork genre passed on to new authors and molded to fit their experiences of its elements of clashing time periods, strange isolated places, and explorations of the uncanny. At a fantastic exhibition in 2015 at the 
the British Library named Terror and Wonder, The Gothic Imagination, they identified modern TV shows like In the Flesh, as well as films like sci-fi classic Alien as works of Gothic fiction too. So in the Invisible Man movie, we begin in a modern house, ultra modern, but one isolated from the outside world, overlooking the empty expanse of the sea, cut off from escape. It's all glass and chrome, a transparent prison for our heroine that looks from the outside like a palace. Throughout the movie, over and over we're reminded that for an abuse survivor, sometimes nowhere is safe. The mansion might be the obvious gothic setting, but every space Cecilia enters into holds that same isolation at its heart. Even when she's with people, she feels isolated because she's the only one who knows the truth, mirroring the emotional isolation of people in our world dealing with post-traumatic hypervigilance or outsider disbelief. The Me Too Era Context In her essay, Female Rage, Revenge and Catharsis, the good for her genre defined in Promising Young Woman, Tara Heimberger suggested that this genre is being discovered, developed and defined via internet culture in response to the misogyny emboldened by the Trump era. The idea that Trump had been getting away with rampant misogyny, even assault for years, and continued to be not just elected but celebrated by so many Americans is itself horrific. Add to this other public moments of bringing widespread sexism into focus, including the Me Too movement, Harvey Weinstein and more, we can see how this is an obvious moment for stories that give the chance for triumph, however unlikely. The end of Promising Young Woman, which decades ago might have had the majority of audiences convinced of justice being done after the credits rolled, is undermined by high profile real life cases like that of Brock Turner. When he was 19, Turner sexually assaulted a woman in an alleyway that was witnessed by two other students who intervened and prevented him from escaping until the police arrived. And yet he was sentenced to only six months in jail and three years probation and was released after only three months. The idea of seemingly watertight proof actually leading to a meaningful conviction is not something Something we have faith in. And that isn't even going into the widespread mistrust of the police through things like the over-policing of black neighborhoods or those who have personally had to interact with them in cases of assault or abuse. In Knives Out, Donald Trump is never mentioned by name, but he and the barbaric immigration policies he championed seep in through the cracks of this movie, most notably during Harlan's birthday party. As I mentioned, the undocumented status of Marta's mother is used to control her multiple times through the movie. Harlan uses it to convince her to go along with his plan because Marta falling into legal drama could result in her mother getting deported. Meg, the most liberal thromby, betrays Marta and discloses her mother's undocumented status when her inheritance is threatened. Walter then attempts to use that information to threaten Marta into renouncing the inheritance. This dynamic reflects the stark reality that being undocumented or having undocumented loved ones makes you incredibly vulnerable. It empowers other people to exploit you and can prevent you from going to the police, reporting crimes or seeking help or resources. Undocumented people are often forced to regularly commit unlawful acts such as faking an address, using forged documents and, like Marta, lying to law enforcement. In Jose Antonio Vargas's article, My Life as an Undocumented Immigrant, he writes, I am still an undocumented immigrant and that means living in a different kind of reality. It means going about my day in fear of being found out. It means rarely trusting people, even those closest to me, with who I really am. It means keeping my family photos in a shoebox rather than displaying them on shelves in my home so friends don't ask about them. It means reluctantly, even painfully, doing things I know are wrong and unlawful. Why? Because the system viciously and violently works against undocumented people rather than for them or with them. The Thrombies are a politically divided family, half are white conservatives and half are white liberals, but none of them actually care about Marta. They only care about how their opinions make them look. The original Invisible Man novel was written in a classic moment for gothic horror, which often portrays clashing cultural periods appearing in times of political change and social crisis. The latest film iteration was seemingly influenced by the Me Too movement and developing technologies in recent years. We see this in the flirty job interview as a familiar experience of workplace harassment. Cecilia's plea of, you have to listen to me, is an echo of many real life abuse survivors. Women not being believed, personally and institutionally, is a very real problem even now. Similarly, her sister's death, probably the most shocking scene in the movie, proves her fear correct. Nowhere is safe for her. Abuse survivors who do seek safety with friends or family often fear the sometimes very real threat that they will get hurt in the process too. Rage versus Hysteria. In an interview, Emerald Fennell, who wrote and directed Promising Young Woman, spoke about the interesting differences between the presentation of men and women in revenge narratives on screen. Blokes go on these dangerous missions, revenge missions all the time and no one minds. But when women do, 
people are frightened by it. Similarly, Carrie Mulligan, who plays the lead Cassie, expanded on this idea, saying, The other day, someone said, Yeah, but is she just crazy at the end? Has she gone full mad? Has the grief driven her mad? The point is that we have countless films about men who go on crusades on behalf of their loved ones, and we never say they're crazy, or that they've lost their minds from grief. They're going around having shootouts and ninja fights in every scene. That is objectively insane. What Cassie's doing by comparison is fairly mild. It's just an interesting reaction because there's a huge amount of logic actually to what she's doing. This is an interesting distinction in the movie because what violence does Cassie actually do? She ultimately gives people ideas and lets their own assumptions, biases and guilt haunt them. When she reveals to the men who take her home on nights out that she is totally sober and that they were about to rape a person who couldn't consent to sex, she doesn't then go on a murderous rampage. She just leaves them with that knowledge. She lies to the dean who dismissed her friend Nina's case due to lack of evidence, suggesting that she'd left the dean's daughter in a dorm room with drunk male students and lets the dean's own knowledge haunt her before admitting the lie. If she truly felt Nina's case was worth dismissing, why is she so worried about the possibility of her daughter being in anything close to the same circumstances? Surely she'd be fine, just like Nina, right? Madness and gaslighting. Gaslighting plays a key role in The Invisible Man. Cecilia even saying, he makes me feel like I'm the crazy one. That's what he does. Adrian's entire plan relies on not just Cecilia, but the people around her thinking that she's crazy. It gives us a brilliant look at a physical manifestation of the internal experience of gaslighting with the invisibility technology. But the movie lets the audience in on the truth immediately. We know straight away that she isn't delusional and that she's in real danger. We see Adrian's breath appear in the cold air, revealing his invisible presence. So we know that she isn't mad. Actress Elizabeth Moss has talked about this deliberate choice by the writers. That was important to us to map out really carefully. There's a small period when she thinks, am I crazy? I could be wrong about this. Then we very carefully put things in place so you are with her, so you believe her through the story, so you're on her side and so you know that she's right. I think it's significant that we also don't see the abuse in her relationship before the film starts, adding a layer to the importance of believing victims. The finale of the movie is so powerful, not just because Cecilia gets her bloody revenge, but because she is so committed to getting the truth from him. I need you to admit it was you, she says. I need to know I'm not crazy. She initially seems to give him the power to grant her closure, or to let her continue to think that she has lost her mind. I know you think you're going insane sometimes, but I'm the only one who can help you, he tells her but we realize that this was part of a larger plan to allow him to think that he holds the power when she intends to kill him either way. Part three, the future of the genre. It's strange to talk about the future of a genre that I just made up the criteria for, which doesn't even have a TV tropes page. You know what, when we look at the history of these central female characters from the final girl to the rape revenge narrative to the good for her movie, we can see a consistent interest in these experiences and themes of agency, catharsis and justice. These themes and their exploration are not going away anytime soon, but they may well evolve again. Who's telling these stories? When we talk about the appeal of these movies, especially to women, this audience reaction is not negated by the creative team behind the movie itself. But I do think it's interesting to note that basically all good for her and good for her adjacent movies commonly listed online are written and directed by men. Hard Candy, Midsommar, Knives Out, The Invisible Man, Mad Max Fury Road, Carrie, Ready or Not, Gerald's Game, You're Next, Suspiria, Us, The Witch, Kill Bill. The few exceptions include Gone Girl that was written by Gillian Flynn who also wrote the book it was based on but was directed by a man, plus Matilda that was directed by a man but co-written by a woman, plus a small handful both written and directed by women, most notably Promising Young Women and Revenge. The development of the good for her genre and its predecessors Processes like the final girl slasher or the rape revenge narrative were all driven by men and their creative visions. The decisions that we take for granted about what makes it into these stories and on screen are up to them. Is it a genre necessity to see trauma and sexual assault on screen or is it just a norm perpetuated by men without any real experience of this as a lived event themselves? Horror critic Mary Beth McAndrews has written about the idea from some film theorists that if a woman made a film about women's pain and trauma, it would go too far in the eyes of the young male spectator. However, even with these films focused on female power in the face of trauma, which articulates a type of feminist politics and grapples with what it means to represent rape, 
they still depend on the torture and explicit exploitation of the female body to shape the narrative. We potentially saw this very prediction come through during the reaction to Promising Young Woman, which deliberately foregoes showing Nina's assault on screen, focusing instead on the character's reaction to it. Like I saw a lot of outrage from male viewers to even the trailer before they'd seen the movie itself. The movie Revenge, written and directed by Coralie Varjar, spends much more time on the tense build up to the moment that the perpetrator won't take no for an answer. Fear is created in the viewer, not through a prolonged graphic on-screen assault, but in that sinking, relatable feeling of inevitability that so many women have experienced. We see her hand and the edge of her face in the corner of a window, but the camera doesn't linger on a full scene or her tormented expression or show us the exact moment that she's violated as so many other movies with this subject matter seem to. In fact, there's a much more gratuitous slow motion shot of a man chewing with his mouth open earlier in the sequence that feels like a tongue in cheek reference to how women's trauma is often captured on film. These pointed differences, even in movies that follow such similar patterns to many created by men on the list, says something to me about the new possibilities we might see when giving women the creative reins to talk about our trauma more often. It also doesn't take an expert of observation to notice that the women shown in this genre are all very straight and white with only a handful of exceptions. Us being the only movie in the original tweets, for example, that featured a black lead. Is this a continuation of that idea in horror of finding the most vulnerable or innocent victim, the universal or likable woman to enact such angry revenge? Would a black or queer woman doing the same be seen as too far? Would these elements of oppression outside of just their gender complicate the genre too much, especially when being written by a team of white men? Social stereotypes and biases might make a young white woman a helpless victim who gains respect and strength through righteous violence, but could make a young girl of color in the same storyline extremist, overly masculine, or even animalistic through the lens of racism. We could view Get Out as part of a potential good for genre around racism rather than sexism. It follows an identical narrative pattern after all. But does that run into a similar issue in the mind of execs of more than one marginalization being examined at a time as too complicated? You can have white women or black men, but like a queer black woman would be too far. So often marginalized groups and individuals are told their rage is unjustified. Would it become too supposedly alienating to default straight white male audiences if these characters were angry at systems that were linked to multiple layers of power and privilege that that audience themselves hold? I am aware that this is a lot of questions for the final section of a video essay, but that's because I'm not sure we have the answers. We don't have enough marginalized creators given the funds and freedom to make art about their own fears and trauma. But when we do, it can be spectacular. Michaela Cole's TV series, I May Destroy You, centers around Cole's character Arabella, a writer working on her second book after viral success with her first. When she goes out one night to avoid thinking about the looming deadlines from her publisher, she wakes up the next morning with only flashes of what happened the night before. Through the course of the miniseries, she pieces together that she was raped in the toilets of the bar they were in and begins to figure out how she wants to process that experience. Other instances of sexual assault and rarely discussed issues of consent also appear throughout the series, including a man removing a condom without informing his partner and a queer character being assaulted by a hookup. The series doesn't seek to teach us or to give us a sense of what the correct way to process trauma should be, but instead asks questions and leaves judgments ambiguous. Arabella is not a perfect person or a perfect victim, but that doesn't matter. The final episode of the series is incredible. It allows her to literally write and rewrite ways she could seek justice and punish her rapist. We see different scenarios play out on screen. She attempts an elaborate plot back in the bar where it all happened, where she's going to find her attacker and inject him with the date rape drug that he uses in a classic revenge fantasy. This storyline ends with her killing him in the street after the plot falls apart, having to drag his body back to her flat and hide him under her bed. Physically and metaphorically in this reality, she'll never be free of him as his presence continues to haunt her day and night. In the second scenario, she decides to call the police after recognizing him in public, imagining justice might be served the legal way. But she is quickly all too aware of the lack of evidence that she has and that he's more likely to be believed than her. Her attacker then turns to her and begins spouting all the doubts that she has about her own trauma, that it's nothing compared to how bad others have it. She ends up bringing him back to her flat and they have an emotional heart to heart before the police arrive to arrest him in a moment that we already know is just part of a fantasy sequence. The final scenario rewrites the encounter altogether, imagining a consensual moment between them where she takes him to bed in her home and is the one penetrating him. 
but that isn't what she wants either. In the end, she doesn't want to enact violent revenge or to heal through an emotional confrontation and mutual understanding with her attacker or to try and persuade herself that she is powerful. She just wants to give herself permission to let that experience and the space it's taking up in her life and her head go as much as she can. There isn't some triumphant punching the air good for her moment in the series. There is just her saying a quiet go. And two imagined versions of her attacker, one alive after the consensual fantasy and one dead emerging from under her bed, leaving her room. Cole herself was assaulted after being drugged while working late on a previous project and has talked about how the show wasn't something she wrote after she had fully processed what happened to her, but rather something that was part of that process. It's been therapeutic to write about it and actively twist a narrative of pain into something with more hope and even humour. She rejected a Netflix deal worth $1 million that would have seen her lose her rights to the show, instead becoming creator, writer, actor, producer and director to retain as much control over her story as possible. This is where I would love to see the future of the genre go. If we value good for her stories for giving us catharsis, validation, justice and heroines with agency, these elements don't have to fit neatly into an existing genre. Allowing women to talk about their own experiences with nuance and originality giving them room to be messy, contradictory, open-ended. That is what I really want to see next. How about you? I hope you enjoyed that foray into film criticism for this spooky season. Um, I have another kind of horror related video plan for next month. So if that is up your alley, if you've enjoyed this video and you aren't subscribed already, please do subscribe because uh, it will pop up in your sub box. Please let me know in the comments what you think about the good for her genre and everything that I covered in the video. If you'd like to support me making videos like this one, then I will also have a link to my Patreon, which has a ton of perks in the description below for you to check out as well as links to all my social media. So you can find me all over the internet. And until I see you next time, bye.